Welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we're glad you could join us for another great hour of answering your gardening questions. As always, I'm joined on the panel tonight by our experts from Nebraska Extension and University Landscape Services. For the first time this season, we have the critter creature, Dennis Ferraro. It's great to be here for 2016. <laughs> we have Bill Kreuzer sitting in the turf and weed chair. Hello, everybody. Kevin Corris resumes his normal position <laughs> as the rots and spots guy. You guys can calm down. Everything's fine. <laughs> and Jeff Kim. Culbertson is going to be answering the horticulture questions. Glad to be here, Kim. And our master gardeners are standing by to help you with your questions. Just dial 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. We also take your questions by email for a future show. That address is byf at unl.edu. You can attach pictures to that email. When you do send us a question, please tell us as much as you can, including where you live. You can also follow Backyard Farmer during the week on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Pinterest, all those good social marketing and media things. Before we get to questions, let's look at samples. We even have like block letters and words. Dennis. Yes. <laughs> what is it? We have a mole with an M, which is a carnivore. These guys eat worms primarily, and they'll eat some insects, mainly ants, and a few grubs, a few grubs. 70% of their diet is actually earthworms. And then we have a vole. The vole is a little flattened because he's been stuffed for so long. And this one is a complete vegetarian. He eats grain. And this is the one that's going to eat your bulbs and your irises and things like that, and maybe even the bark of your trees. So they both can cause problems. This one rips the turf when it's making its tunnels looking for the earthworms, but it's, it's not going to eat anything. If, you, if it eats any vegetation, it goes in one end and out the other end, but this one is the one that's going to cause the most amount of damage. This one you see on top of the ground, this one lives under the ground. And it's important to know which one you have to control. And there's a lot of methods out there uh, for controlling either of these and keeping them out of the yard. Excellent. Thank you, Dennis. I probably have both of them. All right, Bill, what do you have? I have uh, grass, grassy weed. It's popping up. It's um, goosegrass. It is an annual uh, <clears throat> grass like crabgrass or foxtail. And uh, one way to kind of differentiate the different grasses is goosegrass really likes to grow with its leaves kind of like crawling around the ground. And you'll see right at the, the crown where the growing point is of that, that grass, it's kind of a whiter color. Uh, the other grasses are going to be a little bit more upright, and so you'll kind of see this in the gravel, uh, just kind of creeping across that gravel. It's pretty difficult to control this weed uh, post-emergence. There's a couple op options out there, like a claim or Pilex. Uh, but for the most part, um, you know, the best way to really control this is to make sure to get your pre-emergent down, uh, which reminds me, if you made a pre-emergent earlier this year because spring started early and then kind of slowed down, uh, and you have a really high pressure for, for annual weeds, a second pre-emergent app should probably be going out about now if you have a history. If you don't have a history, um, you know, like me, then, then don't apply and, and just keep your eyes out and, uh, you know, try to get rid of it before it gets out of control. All right, excellent. Thanks, Bill. Okay, Kevin, death does not become that spruce. No, this is, a, I found a new variety of spruce. It's called yellow, bronze, and curly. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's not a new variety of spruce. This is a spruce tree that's very unhappy because it's been exposed to a dose of a growth regulator type herbicide. And so you can see that the needles are twisted, the stems are twisted and curly, it's off color, it doesn't look right, the needles are smaller, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's unfortunate. There's not a lot you can do about it except that if you are applying or if your neighbor's applying, hopefully they uh, applying a growth regular type herbicide, hopefully they are very cognizant of the wind speed and the temperature that day, and we can avoid this kind of drift. These chemicals are very volatile. They can um, drift very far in, in the air as a volatile and cause problems where they're not needed to cause problems. So this is simply growth regulator type damage on a spruce. Not a lot you can do about it. Just wait and see if it grows out of it. If it doesn't, prune your tree accordingly and um, just be aware of the environment when you are spraying those herbicides. All righty, thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeff, your sample is a little unfortunate because emerald ash borer has been confirmed in Omaha. Yeah. Yeah. So you have chosen to talk a little bit about uh, the beast and what to do about it. And I think we have a series of pictures for our viewers to help understand what's going on. Okay. 
Well, I think the first picture we're going to look at is of the uh, insect itself, uh, the emerald ash borer. And you can see, you know, we've had questions in the last few years about, you know, do I have this? Because of its color resembles a uh, Japanese beetle, although its body shape isn't similar. Um, there's a green June uh, beetle that is, again, kind of that same color, but their body shapes are much different. And, you know, I like this picture because of its scale. Many of the pictures that uh, for us in the profession we've seen are, are they're gorgeous. Uh, kind of high definition photos of it, and it looks like it's the size of a Buick, uh, the <laughs> picture. So I like with this on the fingertip, you can see it is quite small and, and quite frankly, probably fairly easy to miss because of its size. Um, so, and uh, once they peel the bark on an ash tree, then you would see these uh, tunnels and, and these structures that the, the bore itself makes through the, through the tree, which ultimately, cuts off the nutrients to the tree, and the tree slowly dies. And this is a long process, um, you know, so we're, we're looking at at least four years for, for a good size ash, and maybe up to eight before it really succumbs to this, this situation, to these insects. So, um, you know, I think for the folks in Omaha, and here's a couple websites that uh, folks can go to for information, but, you know, it's really affecting the Omaha area right now. If you're outside of that, I think they're saying Fort Cahoon, the Plattsmouth, Gretna, the Council Bluffs area. Right. You shouldn't be overly concerned at this point until more information and until they, they probably inevitably will find the insect in other locations. So. Good. Well, thank you, Jeff. And we really encourage people to go to a reliable source, which would include the university. Right. Our website as well has exactly. good information about it. So there's some good information out there. And I, you know, stick with that right now and, and evaluate your own trees, how they're located in your yard, those right. sorts of things before you make a decision. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. First critter question okay. comes to you. And this is actually from Northeast Kearney County in Gibbon. This viewer found four tunnels under her deck and then managed to snap a picture of that guy. She, okay. she wonders what it is and she's, she's thinking, it's under the deck, what does she do to get rid of it? Okay. It's a woodchuck or a groundhog, and I don't know how she knows it's a guy because I can't tell you the genders by <laughs> looking at the picture. Um, and being in Kearney, you're at pretty much the edge of their range. Uh, back in the 80s, they only made it into the eastern deciduous forest part of Nebraska. Then by the 90s, they were in Grand Island and Columbus, and now they're already out to North Platte. So mm -hmm. they're extending their range any place there's some trees. Um, best thing to try to discourage them from being down there. Now, there's some big holes. They're diurnal, so they're out there in the day. So if you can kind of get them to come out of the hole, maybe by one of those little smoke bombs you buy. That's not gonna hurt them, it's just gonna kind of get out of the hole. You can pack the hole with uh, pea gravel, and that makes it difficult for them to get back underneath that area. Uh, the other thing, the only legal thing you can really do is to cage trap them, or what we call live trap them. And if you just hold, you know, you want to check that all the time so that nothing happens to the animal. But if they're in the trap for maybe three or four hours and you spray them with water, that's hazing them. <laughs> and then you can, you, you know, legally you can't go more than 100 yards away to release it. But if you release it and they sense that going back to your yard is very, very, you know, disadvantageous because they've been squirted with water and stuck in a cage for an hour, they'll probably go elsewhere. So it's a nice way to do that. You're within the legal ramifications and you won't have that little problem. All right, thank you, Dennis. Okay, Bill, your first picture is uh, of a weed, which is mm -hmm. your favorite thing. Yep. Uh, she is wondering what the tall, slender, sectioned bamboo-looking thing is. The sections come apart. Uh, she's south of St. Paul on the Middle Loop, so okay. she's in one of its ranges. And, sure. And, uh, so it's found in you know, uh, you know wet areas, uh, water uh, can be found also just in, in areas that are you know hilly, poor soils. It's equisetum. It could be called scouring rush, it could be called hor field horsetail, that's why I know by, by horsetail. It's interesting because it, 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 it's uh, very hard to control. Um, it's also interesting because it's got a lot of silica in it, and so uh, you, in pioneer days, you'd use that to actually scour your pots and pans, which I thought was is pretty neat. I've always kind of 
thought that was interesting. Jeff would say it's not even a weed, uh, but if you are <laughs> trying to control, it is tough. We, we put black plastic over it once and, and sprayed it with a uh, herbicide, uh, uh, Quicksilver that had some control in some of our early trials, and it just busted right through it. So um, you're looking at maybe Roundup, or um, if it's in the water, it'd be a Rodeo, which is a, you know the, the, the water version of Roundup, uh, to try to take care of it, or you can just try to embrace it and try to prevent it from spreading out to other parts of your landscape. All right, thank you, Bill. Kevin, shrooms. <laughs> uh, your picture is of shrooms and probably not the edible types, oh. and it's a boatload of them. Mm -hmm. And the question, of course, is uh, they keep coming up in this particular spot. What can they do about it? Um, okay, so I believe this is a, a group of fungi called cop coprinus. It belongs to the genus coprinus. doesn't really matter. It's what we would call a, um, a landscape nuisance fungi. Um, it is probably growing off of an old stump or some kind of organic matter that's buried underneath that soil. So <clears throat> the only thing you can really do is try to remove that food source, which may be really difficult if it's a really large stump underneath the soil. So um, they're going to keep coming up. There is not a product that we have available that's really good for applying to the soil, any kind of a fungicide that's going to take care of that. We don't have anything developed quite yet. So the only thing you can really do is remove them by hand if they're super unsightly. Um, I wouldn't recommend eating them or anything like that, uh, but they should be safe for pets and all that. Just um, you know, practice your golf swing or, or remove them physically um, or dig down into the soil and remove that food source. There's probably a big log or some kind of chunk of something there that it's growing on. So. All right, thank you, mm -hmm. Kevin. Jeff, you get this one, even though it may not belong to you. Okay. <laughs> this is a Plattsmouth viewer who sent in a picture of, of this sort of interesting damage on their apples. And uh, he, he didn't know whether it was, he doesn't know what it is. It, it, it looks you said a, from where? Plattsmouth? It's Plattsmouth, whether okay. it's hail zone or bird pack or sure. some combination thereof. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, you know, I think this is tough. And I, I'm certainly in an area that was uh, received a lot of hail. And uh, we have a cherry tree that in many ways, parts of the fruit have been knocked off. And so we're going to have to clean that fruit off of there because I don't want to have to call Kevin to ask what to do mm -hmm. or Dennis to say what kind of animal is eating all the fruit off of my <laughs> tree because the flesh is rotting off of the fruit. So I would say in something like this as well, I think we would want to clean the damaged fruit off of the tree, mm -hmm. encourage the ones that are still there and in good shape, you know, that'll, it'll help those. And that way we'll help eliminate any diseases down the road. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Well, perhaps after high school, you thought you'd never have to worry about math problems again. Well, when it comes to buying mulch or figuring out how much fertilizer your lawn needs, those math skills can come in handy. Here to help us with some simple calculating tips are Extension educators John Fesch and Sarah Browning. <music> For thinking of product application, you need to think square footage. And when you look at your landscape, whether it's landscape beds or vegetable gardens or the lawn, it's really helpful to break those into geometric shapes like circles and squares and rectangles and triangles. Now in a roughly circular area, we have to just go back to the classroom in algebra and remember that the way to figure out the square footage of a circle is to think about pi r squared. So 3.14 is the pi, r is the radius, and then you do radius times radius to square it. And that way you'll get a number that accounts for the square footage of that area. You can move on then to a different shape, either a rectangle or a square, and that formula is simpler. It's just simply length times width, so maybe 40 feet by 80 feet, and that's gonna give you that square footage. The final one is a triangle. It's really just one half times the base times the height. And so you just do 0 0.5 times the base, the longest part of the triangle, times the height of the triangle. And again, you'll end up with a number that represents the square footage of that area. If you had one geometric shape of each kind, you just simply add them all together and you end up with a total square footage for your landscape. Again, whether it's a vegetable garden, it's a ornamental bed or it's a lawn. And that really helps with knowing how much insecticide, how much seed, how much fertilizer goes on that particular landscape. When it's time to remulch your landscape, you have some decisions to make. First, are you gonna buy mulch in bulk or are you gonna buy bagged mulch? 
buying mulch in bulk will be the less expensive option. And if you have a truck available and you can go and pick up a truckload of mulch, you're going to be able to save a few dollars that way. To buy bulk mulch, you need to know what is the cubic yardage of the area that you want to apply the mulch to. Purchasing bagged mulch is a good option too, and it's more convenient if you don't have a truck or some other big vehicle avail available to, to uh, uh, transport bulk mulch. But mulch in bags will be more expensive. Now with either method of mulching, you do need to figure out the square footage of the area that you'll be applying the mulch to. So again, divide your landscape beds into geometric shapes, circles, squares, triangles. Measure the length and width of those areas and calculate your square footage. Then you also need to decide how deep the mulch will be applied. A traditional, or a traditional depth for a landscape bed is three to four inches. So if you have an area that's 100 square feet and you want to apply mulch three inches deep, then you would take 100 square feet times 0.25, which is a quarter of a foot, and then that would calculate your, your actual cubic footage of mulch that you need. Then your final calculation will be to convert your cubic footage into cubic yards if you plan to purchase mulch in bulk. Now these can be a little bit complicated uh, doing all these equations. There are all, several mulch calculators available online. Even the big box store websites will have uh, quick and easy mulch calculators that you can just input your, your length and width and your depth of mulch and they'll come up with a number for you to give you a quick idea of how many bags of mulch to purchase. <laughs> All right, Dennis, you get the next question. Okay. This is one that will take, send some people uh, scurrying for other places. And of course, that would be, uh, we have a question about IDing oh. a snake. This is a four-footer. Uh, it's actually in Lincoln, and you can, you're can you probably good enough. You can tell yeah. what it is, and it's you a, can tell whether it's a good guy or a bad guy. They're all good guys. It's a bull snake. It's our... <laughs> It's our largest and most common snake in the state, found in all 93 counties. Each rodent carries no germs, virus, or bacteria, or fleas, or ticks, transmittable to people or pets. Um, less to, teeth are less than a sixteenth of an inch, so they have a big bark with no, no bite, and they eat tons of rodents. They love moles and voles, <laughs> and so they're good guys. <laughs> so all those flattened things could yeah. instead end up in right. the tummy of the snake. Mm -hmm. all right. right. Okay, that's okay. Bill, we have an Omaha viewer who uh, is wondering what kind of grass or weedy grass this is, why it is producing these seed heads, whether he can kill it, and if so, how? Yeah, it's, you know, it's tough to see just the seed head, but based on what description, it looks like it's actually pretty small relative to that background. It's probably annual bluegrass, which is a uh, weed of you know all managed turf really um, for a lawn situation. It's generally it happens uh, in turf that's mowed short. So if you're mowing over you know three inches, you're probably not going to have an issue with this weed. It likes shady wet areas. And it is an annual, but it kind of survives as a perennial, so it can kind of linger and linger. It's not really any kind of chemical controls for this, and so you know you want to try to cut it out. But mainly just mowing high will really discourage this weed from uh, proliferating through your yard. All right. It's a bigger problem on like golf course greens. Okay, thanks, Bill. Okay, Kevin, we, we've sort of been bouncing this one back and forth, and we're still not sure, which is really sort of interesting. This is an Omaha viewer. It's a Diablo or a Little Devil nine bark. It's actually the small version. About three years old, it, uh, two or three weeks ago, the, what is supposed to be the buds of the flowers started looking like something from outer space. Mm -hmm. um, our entomologists don't think it's insects. You get a shot at it, and <laughs> then it's a question of how do you manage it, and then do, you, do we think it'll happen again? And if right. it does, what are we going to tell her to do? Yeah, well, this, those second questions, the second part of those questions is harder to, to answer because we don't know what it is. And I thought, yeah, it could be really insane powdery mildew if it's in a, kind of a, a, a shady wet part of, of the landscape, that would make sense. We had a lot of powdery mildew this year. Powdery mildew, it creates this white fuzziness. But when you look at the leaves, there doesn't seem to be any white powdery on the leaves, which you would certainly expect with powdery mildew. So that doesn't seem to quite make sense either. And I thought, you know, just maybe a million mealy bugs. Mealy bugs are white and powdery, but the entomologist didn't agree. So 
To be honest, I have no idea what that is. A sample <laughs> would be great if you would like to send one in. I would definitely take a look at it in the clinic. Um, I, and so uh, how, what, how to manage it, if it's going to come back, I really have no idea because I, I don't know what it is. They're not supposed to look like that. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> Maybe it's something to do with the name. It's the, yeah, the, the, the Diablo in <laughs> exactly. it. Exactly. All right, Jeff, you get the next picture. This is a Crete viewer. Okay. Uh, north facing bed with four azaleas, two mm -hmm. fully flowered, two on the outer edges really didn't flower very well. Flowers were on the lower area, rest of the plants a little stressed. Um, wondering, is this environmental? You have pretty good experience with the collection yeah, you said on north campus. North facing bed. Mm -hmm. and that may be one of our issues right there. Um, the azaleas actually do quite well with a little bit more sun. So I may not want it on the west side of my house, but I certainly, um, I don't know if I'd want it on the north side of my house in too much shade. But that, that's one issue and that certainly will affect flowering. You know, the other issue we have, that's a raised bed, so I'm assuming some soil was brought in. The other plants look pretty healthy. We have a nice layer of mulch. You know, it's, it's having a, an acid enough soil in there. So um, if you are intending to keep them there, then I would look at adding some compost and that sort of thing around the base of the plants without getting too involved with uh, damaging the roots and doing some things like that to try to increase the organic matter around them. Okay, and I think they don't really like to dry out either, do they? They don't like to dry out too much, but I, you know, they're, they're pretty tolerant of conditions. I think we don't, we underestimate their ability sometimes. So. Good, all right, excellent. Well, on our winter show, you may have seen a feature about how we constructed and installed some raised beds out in the backyard farmer garden. We've got a bumper crop in those beds and the rest of our garden has also been installed. Let's take a minute to head over to the Backyard Farmer Garden to see what happened this week. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we finally have all of our warm season summer annual plants planted. The Master Gardeners did a great job on combining those vegetables and annual flowers to make our garden look fantastic for the rest of the season. So we're really looking forward to watching those warm season plants grow throughout the season. We've also been looking at some of those cool season plants. Some of the lettuces are just about ready to be pulled out of, out of our raised beds because with this hot weather, they're not gonna be tasty for much longer. We're also looking at some of the broccoli. We have some broccoli planted in the raised bed, some broccoli planted in the ground, and we can see a big difference in growth pattern between the two. Those raised beds are doing what they're supposed to do and get that so soil warmed up much quicker. So we have a bigger stand and just about ready to start picking that broccoli in those raised beds. So great benefit for raised beds in your backyard farm or garden. So stop by next, sometime this week and check out our garden, see what's growing. While you're doing that, we'll start the lightning round. Are you ready? Sure. Sure. <laughs> In Bellevue, an American elm is dying. What should this person do? Uh, they should have it removed. Yes, yeah. If it's dying, we need to get it out so it doesn't spread that Dutch elm to any other trees in the neighborhood if there's other American elms remaining. Excellent. How soon can a person divide their bearded iris? We want to wait till after the 1st of August. So we've got a little ways to go. We got at least a month to go before we want to think about that. Okay, a viewer with 15 fruit trees wants to know if it's okay to spray glyphosate under them for the weeds. You know, I'm, I back off some of my recommendations on using Roundup under some of those things. I would say, let's kind of keep things mowed. Let's, let's go with that and see if we can control things that way. All right, is it okay to trim lilacs now? This is from Central Omaha. Yeah, sure. They're done blooming, so go ahead and do some of your pruning. And how about moving them? I would want to wait till fall. All right. What about uh, trimming off tomato or pepper leaves that come in contact with the soil? You sure. Yeah, you could do any of that. I, I do that with my plants. I'll, I'll pull some leaves off and do some things for shape and form and all that. So. All right. Hostas and Henderson have turned yellow. What do they need? Well, I guess it, it could be um, the soil being too wet. That mm -hmm. would be one of my concerns. I'd look and see if, we are, if they're over mulched and if they have a lot of mulch, pull that back and see if we can dry the soil out a little bit. Excellent, nice job, Jeff. Okay, all right, you ready? Absolutely. 
Okay, <laughs> is propiconazole available to the public to use for rust? That's a fantastic question. I, I really don't know. Check your products in your, in your local garden store for propiconazole. I, I don't know. Okay. Well, hollyhocks that are totally covered with rust have it next year. Is that kind of a guaranteed rust sentence? Um, not necessarily. It's de uh, dependent on the environment and whether or not the inoculum, the fungus, is in the environment next year. So not necessarily. Okay, so we've had lots of rust questions this year. Is the spray window for rust prior to seeing it or after, and is that window small? It, it is a small window. If you already see big, bright orange pustules, it may be too late to treat. The idea is to prevent it. So you have to apply the fungicide before you even see it. So it, it takes knowing that it might be there and it's a preventative application. Okay, uh, is, the, is the heat and drought that we're approaching, is that good or bad for the spread of black spot in roses? Um, that'll actually be pretty good. All right, uh, brightly colored piles of foamy something or other that look like vomit in the mulch, what is that? <laughs> this, oh, I get this point. Um, uh, uh, slime molds, yeah, just wash them away with a soaker hose, they're not hurting anybody. They're a, a really cool protist, not a fungus at all. So. All right, cool. Thank you. You ready? I hope so. Okay. We had a viewer ask us why or why not they should use Epsom salts on their lawn. Well, they probably shouldn't. Uh, it would be a fertilizer, but we don't have that deficiency in our soil, so I wouldn't worry about it. Okay. How do you kill orchard grass that has crept into bluegrass without killing the bluegrass? Uh, mowing is going to be really helpful to kind of keep it down. Um, and then there may be some, maybe some selective controls. I don't know off the top of my head. All right. Uh, what is the best time of day to water turf when it is 95 degrees and windy? Not the afternoon. <laughs> Honestly, the evening is better than the afternoon. Um, the afternoon, it actually makes the soil warmer, it kills the roots, and the water blows everywhere in our wind. So pretty much any time it's not windy and not in the middle of the, the afternoon. Okay. Can tenacity be used on buffalo grass for crabgrass? Yes. Okay. Um, this person didn't fertilize over Memorial Day. Is it too late now? No, that the weather's no, we're changed? getting into that. For my fa second favorite time to fertilize is like right now. Just watch your lawn. As it starts to yellow up, that's when you put that fertilizer down and go for something with a lot of slow release characteristics to get you through the summer. All right. Nice job. That's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I had one little extra thing. No, I <laughs> you would have had one more question. It would have been easy to answer. Mm, you're like me. <laughs> That'll teach you. <laughs> okay, Dennis, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready for my six right answers. <laughs> a, Hickory, a Hickman acreage owner wants to know how far from their acreage trapped raccoons can be translocated. 100 yards. Okay. In Omaha, we have a viewer who wants to know how they can keep the grackles from eating their onions. Netting. Very difficult. Netting is the only way you can do it. Okay. They protect it. A uh, Fremont viewer had a six inch diameter hole appear overnight at the base of an oak in their garden. What would have done that? Uh, if there was grubs in there, it could be a skunk. Um, they love to do holes like that. Otherwise, it could be something like a badger, but I doubt it. Maybe a woodchuck, but there'd be no food for the woodchuck. Okay, a Lindy viewer wants to know how to keep critters out of their flower pots. Uh, put a dome. Net, netting over it or just you could put metal netting and have the plants come up through it and they can't dig in the plot. Okay, a person wants native turtles for their pond. Is there a source of such thing? You have to get them yourself. You can't buy, sell, or trade, or borrow any native herbs. All right, robins are flying at the window. What do they do to keep them from doing Whitewash that? the window or put the silhouette of a bird in the window? <laughs> I was only five. That was, <laughs> was six. Five. We're going to give him one since he just got on the show for the first time. Okay, Jeff, you get oh, planted. Another week. week. I was having such a good time watching these guys <laughs> compete. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gladys, the shared beauty as always. Yeah, so we have two. We have a uh, kind of uh, pink pink uh, bouquet here today. So, the first one we're looking at here, the taller one, is hollyhocks. Um, uh, usually called mallow, and uh, hers could get quite tall, like full sun. You can see that they're flowering really well right now. And um, what, they get they get mildew, right? What mm -hmm. else do they get? Uh, rust. Rust? Mm -hmm. Okay, so oh, there you go. But hers, hers, doesn't have, hers doesn't have any of those, so she obviously knows what she's doing. <laughs> and then the smaller one here in front is uh, Spirea. She thinks this one is gold flame with the mm. kind of chlorotic looking leaves, which is a lot of our gold 
named plants will have that. So, so spirea and hollyhocks today. Excellent, and that, that particular hollyhock is really perennial. We usually call it a mallow and it seeds itself like nobody's business. Oh. So if you, so you have, have it, kinda, you have it. You have to kind of watch it as it. Yeah, watch it straight. as it leaps across your yeah. yard. <laughs> exactly. Okay, Dennis. Yes. You get the next question about uh, a critter. We've had this one a lot this year. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of appropriate with emerald ash borer probably because what is that and do you what, is, what do you think it's after? <sighs> it could be, you know, a flicker or woodpecker after insects, or it could be a sap sucker is after the nutrients and the starch uh, mm -hmm. in that area. And I see it's got pitch in it. Every little hole has a little bit of pitch in it. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking it's a sap sucker. Okay. And they're very difficult to control. Um, and if there's a lot of them like that, they could cause harm to a tree if they go around the whole tree. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very difficult. And they are protected birds, so there's not much you can do. Okay. All right. So sap sucker and, and not after emerald ash bore, right, borers right. because they're under the bark. Right. All right. Okay. We have a small weed everywhere okay. question, Bill. A very tiny weed. Yeah. Um, the, the leaves, I think, are about the size of a thumbnail, if yep. that. What so is that? Looks like mouse eared chickweed. Uh, one thing you'll notice about it is opposite. Uh, the leaves are opposite of each other. Um, you're going to kind of hairy, kind of a mousier shaped, kind of longer oval. It's a perennial. Um, it's tough to control. It's, it's kind of a troublesome weed. If you're trying to, to spray it um, for some kind of spray control, if you really need that, um, it would be a fall app. It needs to be a product that has multiple active ingredients. Things like a single active ingredient like just 2,4-D or triclopure by itself, fair to poor performance. You start mixing a couple different herbicides and then it's kind of the, you know, uh, many straws that broke the candles back. All right, thank you for that. Kevin, tomato season is mm -hmm. fast approaching. Yeah. Um, this particular one uh -huh. is, he starts them every year from seed. This is a big beef. He's never had this happen uh -huh. with a tomato before. Yeah, that looks like a virus <coughs> to me, and I'm gonna quote Lauren Giesler on this and say, rogue it out. Mm -hmm. The only way you can really get rid of those kinds of issues is to just remove the plant so it doesn't spread to others. When you see that chlorotic patchiness to the leaf or any kind of weird, weird growth, uh, you always kind of think virus. And tomatoes have many, many, many viruses that can attack them. So that's, that's probably what it is. Rogue it out so it doesn't move to your other plants. All right. Thank you, Kevin. And hopefully he has more tomato plants started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or more seed. Or, yeah, exactly. Or a farmer's market. Yeah. Okay, um, Jeff, an Omaha viewer has asked about brown needles at the base of her ewes and browning needles near the trunk of the spruce. So mm -hmm. two different evergreens, two different brown needle situations. So there's the ewe on that one, the spruce on the previous. Well, with the ewe, you know, a, a couple of things I think of with ewes, especially with the wet weather we've had, <coughs> many times we'll see this response with mm -hmm. too wet a feet. Uh, so as we go through the year, hopefully as things dry out, uh, we'll see less of that, but the, there's good growth on both of these plants, mm -hmm. um, so that's um, a good sign. I don't know, Kevin, with the spruce, any ideas with that? Yeah, there, there's a thing called rhizosphera needle cast, which actually causes the inner needles to drop off, but from those pictures, that all looked like natural needle drop to right, me due to right. some kind of environmental stress. Mm -hmm. um, if you have rhizosphera, it, it, there's, it's really symptomatic. Um, what you'll see on a normal unaffected spruce needle, when you look at it very closely, you'll see these little white dots on the needle. That's normal, those are the stomates that's supposed to be there. If you see black dots, that's a good indication that you may have rhizosphera, in which case you might need a fung fungicide treatment, but those look more like environmental stresses All right, thanks guys. <coughs> well, a lot of people love their lush green lawns, but in Nebraska, when things get hot and dry, keeping those lawns green can take an awful lot of water. The University of Nebraska has been actively breeding new varieties of drought-resistant buffalo grass. They love the heat and they don't take much water. So here to tell us more is UNL, uh, UNL turf geneticist, Keenan Amundsen. I think some of the biggest challenges that we've had uh, in terms of adopting buffalo grass, people adopting buffalo grass, is the fact that it's a warm season grass species. And so in our region in Nebraska, the winter time temperatures, the, the, the cold temperatures, 
um, tend to stimulate the winter dormancy response in buffalo grass. And so buffalo grass will go into kind of a strong dormancy in early fall when we start getting that first hard frost and then it won't break dormancy until later in the spring. And when it's dormant, it has sort of this straw color appearance. And so when it's adjacent to say a bright green, tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass lawn, that's a contrast in appearance. If we think back to a few years ago, 2012, when we had that really significant drought, people were clamoring for buffalo grass and clamoring for new varieties that had really good drought adaptation and good drought tolerance. And buffalo grass is probably among the best for drought tolerance for any turf grass species. So some of the other benefits of growing buffalo grass are that it doesn't grow very high. Uh, at full maturity, it's just eight to 10 inches typically, and that's including the male inflorescence, the, the seed heads that, that form on buffalo grass. It is a big commitment to transition from a cool season lawn to buffalo grass. You basically have to spray out your, your lawn and kill it, um, and then seed into it. Or we also, since buffalo grass is also sold as sod and vegetative plugs, you, that's another option for establishment. So you can vegetatively plug your lawn instead of seeding it. So our biggest challenges during establishment is that buffalo grass is fairly slow to establish and because of that it gives a lot more time for, for weeds to take hold and, and establish and then weeds outcompete buffalo grass. Uh, and so weed control during establishment is critical in order to have a healthy buffalo grass stand. Some of our newest varieties of buffalo grass uh, have better establishment rate, higher canopy density, better shoot density, better mowing uniformity, and for our producers, they, they have better production value. So they produce a lot more seed, they have better sod strength and some of the other characteristics that are important in a turf stand. Uh, our newest seeded variety was released two years ago in 2014, and that was Sundancer buffalo grass. Uh, again, it's a seeded variety, and it's really better than a lot of the other seeded varieties that have been on the market um, up until this point because it has a uh, much faster establishment rate. So typically buffalo grass is not known for having rapid establishment. And so that's really an important characteristic of Sundance or buffalo grass. Uh, it has good dark green color. It's broadly adapted. It's been shown to perform really well in, in several different states throughout the country. The main priorities of our buffalo grass breeding program are to develop improved shade tolerance, improved traffic tolerance. Those are both important characteristics for any turf. Uh, shade is one of the biggest challenges facing any landscape, so trees provide a lot of shade. We love our trees, but they outcompete sun, and so turf's hard to grow in those environments. Uh, turf grasses are generally unique from other grasses in that they tolerate traffic. You can walk on them. And so improving traffic tolerance is, is critical for the success of any turf grass. And so we've been making great strides in our breeding program to advance shade and traffic tolerance. As Keenan said, it might take a little patience to get buffalo grass established, but there are some really great benefits of having that low input drought resistant turf installed in your yard. No shade, no dogs, but nevertheless. Yeah, right? It's good better with those things, honestly. Well, there you go. Better and better is better, and that's, that's what we're for, supposed yeah. to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We want to make a little correction on math, and I will just be the first to say I don't do math, but I know this one, and that would be if you're going to cubic yards, you divide by 27, not by 12. So think of that Rubik's Cube, 333 three, three, makes 27 right. for the mulch. Okay, Dennis, you get okay. the next picture. And this is of a particular bird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's talk about the bird. Well, that's a bobwhite quail, but it's a mutation. Um, people, some people, like to take animals and work with their mutations because they think they look better than what nature evolved. And um, I kind of disagree, but the people do it. Bob white quail, since they're native, you're not allowed to release them or have them in any kind of pen they can get out of by Nebraska Game Parks Commission. So um, I think you even need to have a permit to have a Bob white quail mutation even in a cage in the state of Nebraska. And I think this one was delivered and dropped off someplace where it shouldn't have been. <laughs> but uh, so if you go to exotic pet place and buy something, check the regulations, whether that mm -hmm. can be put into the state of Nebraska and how it can possibly be kept in the state of Nebraska. Because we don't want that mutation ending up in our native birds, mm -hmm. period. Pure and simple. All right, it, it was pretty, but 
Yeah. It wasn't, Only in the eyes of the beholder. It wasn't supposed to, to be me, where that, it was. Yeah. If it's a yeah. mutation, it's yeah. not pretty. Yeah. It's a mistake. There you go. Okay, this is this is a fun one, uh, and and these uh, these viewers actually sent us quite a document about this bill. Um, weedy grass ID and control, and it and it was an interesting situation with what we think it was. So, any ideas on weedy grasses that would look a little bit? Yeah, like yeah. Some of the other pictures I was looking at too. You know, I was, I was going through looking. It's tough to identify grasses. Period. But then you know, a picture is always difficult. Uh, some of the things they were talking about was that it's you know really aggressive, a lot of underground rhizomes, mm -hmm. uh, that seed head structure. I'm really thinking that's uh, a quack grass. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a grass that we don't have any selective controls for on our lawn, and so it really is going to require a non-selective control, and it will get out of control because of those because of those rhizome networks. So if you start pulling it, it's just going to you know make it mad, and it's going to really start to uh, pop up new plants. So it's going to be a tough one. You might have to you know do the paint on Roundup. Uh, um, to try to get rid of this particular grass, it's, it's difficult. All right, and some of the wheat grasses do that too, don't they? They're just crazy rhizomatous sorts of things. Yeah, I was thinking that. Um, there's a couple other grasses too. I guess a couple of different pictures fly through and so. Right, yep, all right, so patience mm -hmm. and the glove of death. Glove of death. <laughs> all right, Kevin, um, this is a, uh, a viewer who had a young flowering crab that flowered this spring. A couple weeks ago, the leaves started to curl. Within about five days, it has all turned brown. The leaves are dried and crispy. Some young little leaves toward the bottom. She wants to know if it can be revived. Mm -hmm. And, and we've, we've actually seen a lot of this on smaller crab apples this year. Yeah, it's hard to say there. It looks like it's relatively young, new transplant. It could be just that the transplant didn't take well. It didn't establish its root system. It could have been root bound. Mm -hmm. There could be, you know, if we look lower on the stem, there could be an issue down there. Mm -hmm. uh, sadly, the fact is, I think that tree is dead. It flowered on its reserves this spring mm -hmm. and um, it was just on its last life. Uh, unfortunately, there's no prayer. It's time to replace. All right, and uh, not don't do it in the hot, though. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, wait a little bit. Okay, Jeff, uh, yours is a simple one. She's um, our, our viewer said, please ID, okay. <laughs> and then we'll figure out whether we should control it or keep right. it. Right, sure. Um, you know, the, this looks like a brassica. I'm, I'm guessing it's brown mustard. Uh, looking at the, the seed pods and the flower, it's certainly a mustard. Um, so it's one of those that's a lot of seed there on that plant right now. And if we let that mature, uh, you will have even more next year. So at this stage, I think that's something that we want to make sure we're controlling. Hand pulling, it's, it's easy to pull. And um, so it's something we want to get out of that, that area. We don't want to encourage that. You know, certainly I think from the old days, alfalfa fields would get kind of polluted with that yeah. and so yeah. you know that would be a hassle for folks right beautiful and when you see a whole field of it when you flower. see a field of it it's, it is gorgeous <laughs> yeah and too late yeah yeah <laughs> all righty well we have some announcements of cool things in the gardening world garden magic douglas Car uh, sarpy extension and 4-h saturday the 11th at the eastern nebraska 4-h center five miles south of gretna that's our first one. Second is the Lincoln Garden Club breakfast and tour this Saturday, June 11th, 7.30 to 8.45 is kind of the start time at the Trail Center, North 21st Street. And the third one is all about us. We are going to Gehring, Legacy of the Plains Museum. We're going to be taping a show from noon to 1 p.m. Mountain Time. We are really looking forward to both the trip and the opportunity to be in the, in the Panhandle for the first time in a long time, or at least in my tenure. Okay, uh, Dennis, you get a question. We're almost out of time, but okay. this is a Shelton viewer. Um, garter snakes are appearing that have been partially eating. She's got crows in, in the yard, but would they do that? Yes. <laughs> okay. Definitely crows. Uh, partially eaten, pecked apart is, go is gonna be a bird of prey or a crow. Crows love garter snakes, and so do red-tailed hawks. Uh, blue jays love them as well. Okay. So yeah, they're food for a lot of birds. So. Okay, all right. Um, Bill, any way to kill Rock's favorite grass, which is taking over bluegrass. So zoysia is taking over the bluegrass. Any way to kill one without the other? Yep, we actually have new technologies now that we can use to control zoysia grass. And so that uh, the, the herbicide Pilex is something that's available. 
that kills warm season grasses in cool season grasses. So if you have buffalo grass, you have zoysia grass in your cool season, now we can selectively control uh, these weedy pests. And that's why we talked about maybe using those uh, in last week's show, because we're gaining some new controls and new ways to manage these, these different grasses. All right. Um, Kevin, this is actually almost a follow-up. It's an Iowa viewer that has a spruce. The, the, the foot of new growth, give or take, looks good. Behind that, it's dead. Anything they can do. <laughs> um, again, if it is actually rhizosphera causing that needle casting in the middle of the tree, they can apply a fungicide, but not until... I think we've, we've missed that window. Um, the application window for rhizosphera is when the new candle is about an inch to an inch and a half in growth and we're way past that. So um, for next year they could, but I would try to get it diagnosed, look at the needles, look for the little black spots. Otherwise, if it's just the inner needles, it could be natural needle drop from the weather. All right, so uh, a little bit of diagnostic. Might help, but just happen. give it time to see you know, what happens. It might lose that inner innerness, but <laughs> whether it'll spread to the outer needles. Right, not a, not a really good year for a lot of things in spruce True. too. Yeah. So, and Jeff, we're out of time, so you're out of luck, which means you're off the hook. Oh, great! Because this was send me an email. Really, really. <laughs> <laughs> this was a really tough question. <laughs>